thank you also for my part for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to come here and hope it's a pleasure for you also to listen to me. I do my best for this. Um, what the handout is concerned, um, thanks very much for um, the people who are hard working to support all this. Um, I, I must perhaps say that the, the row maybe is a bit confusing. I shall then tell you at what slide we are. I just um, made it given to you because I could imagine uh, the, the last row for, for you, maybe it's a bit too small, the letters, so you can check it on the respective slide. But the, the movie will be here. And the subject is private law, private law society, a scheme of private law answering some of the difficult questions. There are many difficult questions, of course, um, I will concentrate actually on one or maybe two. How does private law, it is law without state, without statist statutes and so on, how does private law cope with violence, with force, with physical force? And the second difficult question in this connection, of course, what is the relation between this scheme of private law on the one side and state law on the other side? This will be the point today. Now, if we speak of private law, um, all statists, is this a word, statist, etatisten, statists? Yeah. Statists or also classical liberals will say, that's fine, you know, your paradise where the lion lies beside the lamb in peace, you know. Um, but this won't be your case, it will be the law of the jungle, the law of the strongest, of course, law in quotation marks because it's not the law, it's just power. This will be um, your world, it will always shift to that wrong side over there, to unlawfulness. You won't succeed in pulling it on this side, on the lawful side. He will say that outlaw over there, he will act aggressively. The best you can do, you can stand still when he comes. You can step aside. Maybe you will fall down. But I would say that already a little bit decelerates, perhaps, his aggression. And now the victim will raise um, its voice against it. And maybe the other one will hesitate a bit. And the victim begun, begins to argue. This is this ping pong here, you know, of this um, uh, aggression, how it works. Of course, the other one will argue back. He has the right. And he, the victim now will accuse him, perhaps. For now, he, he begins to speak, to shout, it's aggression. The other one maybe becomes a bit embarrassed. Um, he will shout for others to help, for bystanders, for friends. The other one will now really slow his aggression and maybe these thirds coming to help will, you know, threaten now. It becomes a bit red. I, use these colors, peaceful situation is green. This is not a political um, allusion. Um, um, while the aggressive part is red, so now these thirds come in and threat maybe with a certain firmness or even violence. So also on the side of the private law, you have force, of course. They are not just peaceful lamps on the private law side. And now the other may be, now he stops aggression. Now on this side, you say, because it's just the provisional stop, now um, we have somebody to look at it, to judge it. They call for a judge, of course not a pre-existing judge, but some independent person to be called for. Maybe the other one, 
to come out of this situation agrees to it and out of this ping pong, out of this um, um, conflict mainly by voice, by voice and not by force, um, this cools down and comes to this judgment before this judge, they again, you know, um, exchange their arguments, there is the decision and now maybe it is very simple and uh, let's say standardized case, you will be successful to pull it on this green side here. Um, the features of this, you can say, the law specific attitude is First talking, negotiating, arguing, and then, if necessary, acting. While on the unlawful side you have the opposite, first they act, and then via this process they are drawn in a way into talking, negotiating, arguing. You have on the one side here maybe an increase in, I would say, in firmness, maybe in, in violence if necessary, and on the other side you have a decrease of violence. So this is a bit really in a nutshell and very much simplified of course, um, a first pattern how private law works. But then our dialogue partner, our classical liberal or our statist will say, again this is very nice, we have now this judgment, or maybe they did not even find the judgment, let's assume that also. Um, the victim expects compliance by outlaw. Did you find it? Um, so it's, well, first look at the right slide, which starts with judge decide or no judgment at all. This is now our second slide. And you still expect that now it works. But the outlaw, of course, says our dialogue partner will not comply. But then you have a uh, sort of alliance, not only the victim, but the judge of before, his friends, maybe bystanders, they now are blaming this outlaw of outlawfulness. He be gets a bad <coughs> reputation, maybe he hesitates, maybe nevertheless he continues with his aggression, but if this is the case, we could imagine that this alliance on this side will also use force to, you know, resist to this. And on the other side, this again now slows the aggression, but let's remain uh, pessimistic. Um, nevertheless, that could also be an escalation of violence, you know, on a higher level, so to speak. Maybe on the other side, an even bigger ally, uh, alliance who again maybe first accuses him of outlawfulness and maybe, if it's really necessary, force comes up on this side as well. If they are successful and if they succeed to defeat this outlaw, they will perhaps insist on an armistice. Maybe on the other side he will say, no, not just an armistice, somebody else must again decide about this dispute. Maybe that again will lead to some judge who decides or some settlement proceedings and out of this, again, my um, idea, it could be possible at least to hold it on this side with these patterns, typically law, first talking, then acting, the other way round on this side. We have decrease of violence thanks to increase of firmness on the left side. Left side also not a political illusion. Now we have still our interlocutor who is pessimistic and he says this is wonderful, all these you know, strong organizations that found a settlement, um, maybe they will comply in it, but I would not be surprised if at least internally now, this, you know, this brutal gang leader with his gang, he now will respect the other gangs or the other organizations, but maybe even more so internally, he will be aggressive 
because he is aggressive. And if not externally, then he will use it internally. He is not just aggressive, maybe he is even intelligent. Now he invents crazy um, theories for his internal competence. He will say, um, you know, this mafia boss, um, he collects protection money, um, Schutzgeld. This is protection money. Um, um, you know, it's, it's um, in your favor. Um, I care for your security and this costs something, so please um, pay me 10% of your income or whatever. Um, and uh, maybe some Sully people begin to believe it, and so he can, uh, he can make his unlegitimate influence without um, real uh, legitimation. But of course, they are not all that silly. Um, internally now, there will be counter theories. They will say, oh no, this is just Ill illegitimate power. Um, this um, protection money is not a due. Um, of course, this will be suppressed from that side with force. But this then could be, now we are in this internal pattern, you know, the beginning of the revolution. And there will force and violence take place um, because they do not accept this attitude of this gang leader. Um, maybe this revolutionary attitude will, sw sw will switch over to other such organizations as well. Um, so the question of how are they legitimate to act internally will be a common discussion or maybe a common conflict in red, in maybe even in physical um, conflict. Um, maybe at the end all these players begin to say actually we should, you know, find some negotiation, a settlement out of it and then again. Um, our pattern, not to repeat it in all details, but um, even in such cases, I think this general pattern has still the possibility to pull it on this side. And now, um, he is still not. Um, at the end, our uh, discussion, um, they say, that's really wonderful. Now you have a settlement, you know, society-wide, all these strong players, but also the revolutionaries and, and everybody. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if just because they think they are more legitimate now, these organizations, they become again quite arrogant. Um, be it old gang leaders, be it revolution leaders that became gang leaders, um, whatever, but a certain arrogance could come up. And of course, that could be even, you know, the beginning of a big aggression internally and externally. And now our dialogue partner, our classical liberal will say, look, and now maybe it's not a big probability that this will happen after all these experiences, but it's possible. And I will now paint the devil at the wall. This, this is a, a saying in German, den, den Teufel an die Wand malen, to, to paint the devil at the wall, and once you do it, he will come. Or um, as a warning, do you want this, do you want the devil? And in this matter, he will say, this aggressivity, will then lead to the ultimate war between all these gangs internally, the ultimate repression. So this is really the um, um, apocalyptic end of your private law paradise. Do you want this? Um, he will say, um, and of course I will say, no, this is really not what I want. Um, um, I would at least hope that's not very strong anymore, but um, because the probability is not that big. But even if it happens, I would say, somewhere this 
terrible fight is over and all will shout never again. We won't do it never again. We made all the experiences now. Now we really have to make a settlement which is more um, sophisticated, more fundamental a settlement between all these losers. They are all losers after such an event of war and terrorism. They will say no strong players anymore, small units, no monopolies of power, no compulsory memberships, things like that. That, I would say now, is still the possibility, even in that hard case, that could come um, to the effect that we have it on this, on the, the good side, so to speak. But we are still not at the end. Of course, this discussion can go further and further. And um, even though I say it is expected, at least, that this private law um, row will prevail in the end, um, the other side will say, oh, I'm not that optimistic. Um, nevertheless, it could be possible that the really ultimate worst case could happen. Um, it's maybe not very likely, he would say, a low risk that this happened, but it can happen. And it's that terrible, you know. Um, you have then really the strongest of all who has won this battle. And all others, other gangs, other subsidians, all are um, subject to him without any condition, without consent. They are just his slaves. No other strong rivals are accepted. Um, there will be suppression of critique by, again, by crazy justifications or by physical force. And our classical liberal and our statist would say, is this now you private law lawyers um, what you want? Um, um, you need the, you have you need the state to avoid this. And of course, my answer is clear. You have it already. The devil who paints it at the wall. This very ultimate worst case, that's the state. The devil, the state paints at the wall in order to justify his monopoly of law and order. You know it now already. Is himself. Um, and so the choice is not paradise versus hell. But um, I would say it's better to have only a certain probability, not a big one, but however, to have a probability of this worst case is better than to have the worst case. <laughs> a second point is out of a specifically legal point of view, abolishment of state is not just a political program and not just an economic necessity, but first of all, required by law. And so a consistent way to work on the abolishment of the state is to initiate legal proceedings arguing that its inherent characteristics are against the law. I will sketch in within two minutes. Do I have this time? It's because we started a bit, a bit later, so... Okay, very good. Um, it takes some time to abolish the state, of course. <laughs> Maybe I won't really um, meet it any more lifetime. But the younger among you, I, I hope you will be um, under those who realize you see it. Um, I, and therefore, I will give you just a, a short um, check, um, uh, sketch how, how such a, a proceeding could look like. And I will then also give a short explanation why I think it's high time. Now, this, this sketch of such a proceeding, why not? I'm from Switzerland. You know, this is this, uh, this small country up in the mountains there uh, where they have direct democracy, they say. Uh, actually, I can tell you that's not the case. That is what they say, um, but if you calculate, it's, 
it's just not the case. But, but that's another story. In any event, I'm from there. And so why shouldn't we start there? Why not to introduce an action against that organization there against that central state. Many plaintiffs, many victims of this Swiss central state. Um, now, um, I, I can offer myself as an attorney if you want. I have my, car, my cards with me, um, or many others, thousands, tens of thousands, um, who are victim of this um, strange central state. Defendant is this strange organization called Schweizerische Eidgenossenschaft, which means Swiss Confederation. They have a number even. There is an official register of public and private entities. You know, Novartis has a number, and um, our law firm has a number, and this uh, Swiss Confederation has a number. The, OK, this is the defendant. And the legal remedies I would request is granting the plaintiffs the right to withdraw their membership. Maybe one should first declare, you know, the withdrawal. These are details. I have to work on it. It's not yet ready. <laughs> or, as an alternative, dissolution and liquidation of defendant. You would be the court for this. <laughs> I, I have a majority, I think, of this court. Um, in addition, compensation for damages suffered um, so far, taxes, you know, without consideration and return, taxes are owed unconditionally, as you know, uh, without getting any, um, uh, any, anything as in return and or for profits inhibited. All these profits inhibited by regulation. Yesterday we talked about black um, economy, uh, which is killed by regulation, and any economy is killed by regulation, so um, this will cost something. Um, now the question, who is the competent court? Certainly not the Swiss Supreme Court. Um, but we will have to find some. Uh, maybe it's a arbit sort of arbitration court, maybe the Prince of Liechtenstein, I thought. Or, or we will see. But there are a lot of, of things in these proceedings that are still open, but this is my point. It's a legal proceeding, procedure, you know? It's a legal issue. It's not a political, not only a political issue, it's a legal issue, so let's go to it legally. Of course, as usual, as a lawyer, I say before introducing, I offer negotiations about the modalities of all this. Perhaps we can find a settlement. For instance, the, t the time period to organize this secession, there are a lot of maybe technical um, questions, the conditions for the use of state infrastructure afterwards, you know, then you're not a taxpayer anymore, but you have still to use these monopoly um, um, things from the state, so what is the price for it? Uh, this must be discussed. Um, then the time period in the other, in the alternative case, the time period to organize this liquidation, not in three days, this is a long process, it must be in a professional way, 10 year, 20 years, something like that. Um, the amount of compensation, of course, uh, this will be a, a hard fight. Um, <laughs> The costs of these proceedings, the lawyers, you know, they're always quite expensive. Um, accompanying, I would say we must have a certain publicity, you know, in the media, in internet, and um, everything is quite open and should attract more uh, plaintiffs. And I thought, from an economic point of view, accompanying one could um, influence the rating agencies, you know. If do you tell them that now the power of the state to collect taxes is legally challenged, I think they would not dare to 
maintain their triple A rating for Swiss Confederation. And then the interests go up and so on, so this gives us more position in these negotiations. Now, I said it's high time, and this will be my final remark. Now, why it is high time to make it? Um, you recall this, this chart here, it's one of those, um, where we made this, the start was the settlement between this, the strong outlaw and these strong counterparts. And if you now put it from the scene we had before to the international or historic level, you find a lot of analogies or of parallels. So this settlement is nothing but the Westphalian Peace Treaty um, of 1648 where all these strong players formed a certain structure. Um, this crazy marketing, you find it in Hobbes' Leviathan. The other theories are, for instance, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Contrat Social. Of course, what then came was the French Revolution. Now this transfer to other countries, these were the Napoleonic Wars. And after that, this one thought final settlement, that was the Vienna Congress. And now the next slide, with these terrible scenarios, these arrogant, pseudo-legitimate organizations, this is the typical pattern of the national states, mainly um, created in the 19th century. Of course, what they did, you know, these two world war, the Holocaust, um, and now let's remain on this global or international level, we have this absolute um, apocalyptic case that then would be the one world state. We do not have it yet, but it's very, very close, as you see in the long time um, history. Our settlement, that would be this alternative, the constitution of anarchy, or however you call it. And when I said it's high time, then it's because we are here and it's really high time to see that it goes on this side and not on that side. Thanks very much.